Hello everyone and welcome to this discussion on central bank digital currencies or CBDCs uh, through a commercial banker's lens. I'm John Orchard, CEO of the central banking think tank OMFIF, which also runs the Digital Monetary Institute, which specialises in CBDC. I've got an excellent panel with me today. Uh, we have Tom Mutton, uh, director of the CBDC unit at the Bank of England. We have uh, Florence Lubino, who is head of central banks and supranationals and MDBs in continental Europe at BNP Paribas. We have Soon Chong Lim, who is uh, group head of global transaction services at DBS uh, Bank in Singapore. Uh, and we have Tony McLaughlin, uh, Managing Director, uh, Emerging Payments and Business Development at Citigroup. Uh, welcome, everyone. We ran a poll on LinkedIn ahead of this session asking uh, the audience whether CBDCs is an opportunity, threat or neither from a commercial bank uh, perspective. And the overwhelming response, 66%, uh, uh, was that it's uh, an opportunity. Um, that slightly surprised me based on roundtables at the DMI, which have looked at the risks to the incumbents uh, in the financial architecture, with new entrants from the technology space specifically looking to displace banks in some cases. Banks, of course, perform a number of vital tasks beyond transaction services, uh, including credit creation uh, and uh, regulated oversight of money movements, uh, among other things, uh, which central banks in general don't uh, wish to jeopardise. Uh, that's also one of the points uh, of this discussion today. Uh, many of the early conversations on CBDC, certainly in my experience, uh, overlooked uh, the complex role which commercial banks play in both payments uh, and the creation of money uh, or its oversight, uh, and indeed didn't include these institutions uh, in the debate, really. Uh, that's changed in the meanwhile, uh, and the world's most important CBDC experiment, arguably uh, that of the PBOC, uh, is specifically designed not to disintermediate them or accidentally uh, defund them. Um, there are other stakeholders, though, including at some central banks, uh, who would like to see commercial banks put under competitive pressure uh, in the payments arena. Um, banks have worked with technological revolutions before. Uh, not long ago, we had uh, the P2P revolution, which they co-opted successfully. Uh, will they succeed uh, this time? Um, we're lucky to have both commercial banks and a central bank to explore this with you today, as I mentioned. Uh, and we're also going to ask you, the audience, the same poll question at the end of this panel about whether CBDCs uh, are an opportunity for banks uh, after we've explored the issues. So do also send us your questions through Slido as per the instructions uh, on the screen, and we'll come to those in about 40 minutes. Firstly, Tom, um, could you briefly describe why central banks are looking at CBDC uh, at all? Well, thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to, to speak with everybody today. Um, just a, a brief definition, really, two different types of central bank digital currency, which are often uh, talked about. Uh, the first one would be a retail central bank digital currency. Uh, so this would be, uh, in some forms, perhaps uh, thought about as being maybe a digital banknote, uh, an item provided by the central bank uh, to meet the basic payment needs of households and businesses. Now, in the UK, we're exploring this uh, with great interest and, and with pace and with purpose, but, but no decision has been taken yet on whether or not one is needed in the UK. Uh, this would be a really uh, quite significant uh, innovation in money uh, and something which we'll have to very thoroughly explore before deciding whether or not we should do it. Now, as I said, a retail central bank digital currency, I think, would be a new form of money uh, in our economy. Uh, at the moment, uh, central bank money, which is the safest form of money, uh, is only available to, uh, uh, to, to individuals, to retail users, uh, in the form of banknotes. Uh, so were we to make this uh, central bank money available electronically for the first time, that would be a big step. And I think much of the uh, discussion and deliberation around retail central bank digital currency uh, is around the value of providing uh, that very safe central bank money in retail form to individuals. Uh, and whether that's something which uh, is needed, something which people value, um, and uh, to think about how that can support payments innovation. But we also have to consider whether actually many of those benefits which we might seek to achieve from our retail central bank digital currency might just as well be delivered through private innovations. Uh, and certainly in the UK, the Bank of England uh, is very supportive of safe and responsible private innovation. Uh, so uh, that's retail central bank digital currency. I think probably what we'll spend most of our time talking about today is actually wholesale central bank digital currency uh, used for clearing the settlement uh, for wholesale payments, capital markets. 
Uh, we're very enthusiastic about this, and it's great to speak with a, a panel who are so knowledgeable on the topic, real thought leaders. Um, my perspective is that uh, whilst wholesale central bank digital currency is uh, extremely exciting and something uh, we think is very important at the Bank of England, um, it uh, has actually been around for a long time. Uh, we have digital central bank money uh, available to wholesale participants uh, in the form of central bank reserves for those uh, who are eligible to have access. So in a way, wholesale central bank digital currency uh, has been around for a long time. I think much of the debate uh, and discussion around wholesale central bank digital currency is actually as much about an innovation in technology as it is uh, in an innovation in money. Uh, and I think if there are new ways to interface with uh, reserves, uh, to think about how to, uh, to, to use them uh, and how best to, uh, to interact with them uh, through new technology platforms, uh, then I think that's a, a really positive uh, development. Um, so yes, really look forward uh, to talking to everybody today. Uh, thank you, Tom. As you say, we'll spend uh, quite a lot of time on the wholesale side, just uh, briefly on the retail side. Um, to uh, the man or woman in the street, uh, they might uh, wonder uh, what's, uh, what's wrong with the system that seems to be working um, ad hoc for them pretty well, uh, where M1 uh, is used through uh, various payment platforms on uh, uh, the contactless functions of um, uh, cell phones. Um, is there uh, anything in inherently wrong with that from the central bank point of view? And I realise that you haven't finished consulting and decide about it, deciding about it at the Bank of England. So uh, the first thing I should say is that um, we encourage payment innovation where it's, where it's safe and responsible. And I think uh, merchants, businesses, users have benefited from payments innovation over quite a long period, actually, in the UK. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we should, uh, you know, we should just stay with what we've got today. Uh, we should encourage further innovation. And I think central bank digital currency could, could be part of that. Uh, but we have to check that it is going to add sufficient value. Uh, I think that actually um, one of the things we have to be really conscious of is that people's payments needs uh, may evolve quite quickly and possibly in ways that we can't fully anticipate. Um, of course, you know, uh, many people possibly didn't think they needed the iPhone uh, when it first launched and now we can't live without them. So um, you, we should be open-minded on innovation. And I think the really critical question is this one of uh, the value of having central bank money and the security and safety it offers uh, and whether that is important for people to have in digital form. Um, I don't think that uh, central bank digital currency should seek to offer you know, a better user experience or greater innovation than the private sector can provide, because I don't think that's the, the, the comparative advantage of the central bank. Uh, what I imagine we would do if we were to do a retail central bank digital currency would be to partner really closely with the private sector. We've published a platform model where we've set out some of our ideas to make sure that we're working to our comparative advantage, which is security and safety of the money, and that the interfaces and intermediaries involved uh, would be providing uh, a really great customer experience uh, and meeting customers' needs. Great. Thanks, Tom. Uh, that's clear enough. Um, Soon Chong, DBS uh, headquartered in Singapore uh, is in a jurisdiction where uh, the central bank has run a blockchain sandbox for several years uh, um, and is now leaning against implementing a retail CBDC, I believe, uh, but is very interested in the wholesale potential that Tom just mentioned. Uh, meanwhile, in uh, China, I mentioned already, um, they are furthest ahead on retail CBDC among the big economies. Uh, and uh, it was already a world leader on digital retail uh, payments. Is the CBDC arena moving fastest in Asia, do you think, uh, Soon Chong? Uh, John, first of all, uh, thank you, everybody. It's a good, great pleasure to be here today with everybody. Um, on this question that you asked about whether the CBDC is moving fastest in Asia, I uh, certainly can't uh, uh, comment on that. But I think for whether it's moving, moving very fast in Asia, it certainly is uh, very moving very, very quickly in Asia. As you uh, have mentioned, John, um, in Singapore, the MAS has launched a retail CBDC hackathon, right? Uh, whereby the MAS has uh, brought in financial institutions as well as uh, fintechs uh, to participate in solving the problems uh, with retail CBDCs. Uh, I'm happy to note that uh, DBS is also uh, offering Patio, uh, Patio, which is the consortium that we created with Tomasek, uh, as well as JP Morgan, to be as the core infrastructure for that uh, hackathon sandbox. Um, and in MAS, it's uh, not only interested in retail CBDCs. As you may be aware, the MAS has also launched Project Tunba, uh, which is a four-party experiment involving the MAS, the BNM, the Reserve Bank of Australia, and the Reserve Bank of South Africa to talk about uh, CBDC interoperability and the technology infrastructure that might allow the in interoperability of central bank digital currencies. 
Uh, and uh, further afield, we have got Hong Kong, uh, which is which is uh, partnering the BI's Innovation Hub uh, in China to launch an MCBDC bridge project. Uh, and as you mentioned, in China, um, the PBOC has launched the ECNY pilot. Uh, they have already articulated how the retail CBDC uh, distribution will work uh, through a multi-tier uh, distribution framework. Uh, they have also decided the first batch of commercial banks and fintechs that will join uh, the CBDC pilot. Um, and we also look uh, a bit, uh, with a bated breath on whether the PBOC will be taking ECNY uh, for cross-border use cases, whether is it for retail, outbound travel, uh, e-commerce, for which many of the China's fintechs are uh, e-commerce powerhouses, uh, and perhaps even for wholesale use cases. Uh, and that I think that if they decide to do that, there will be significant developments in Asia about the rearrangements of the currency that will be used for cross-border trade and investments. As you know, so much of the cross-border trade and investments that are intra-Asia uh, happens in US dollars, right? And if the central banks get the act together or with uh, PBOC having resolved uh, to have the ECNY used for cross-border purpose, that could really be a significant development in terms of the, uh, the monetary arrangements and the use of uh, uh, settlement mechanisms for cross-border trade and investments. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, you touch on the interoperability uh, issue, which comes up uh, uh, a lot. And actually, um, we also hear commercial banks say, um, you may struggle that with that, but we can uh, we can already do it, and we'll come back to that theme in a moment. Just to uh, to tour around the world, uh, the U.S. isn't um, uh, particularly represented here, but there are a lot of uh, pilots going on the Boston Fed and elsewhere. Uh, but uh, a, a degree of caution. Uh, there was a, a piece in the Washington Post uh, the other day suggesting people close to the Biden. Um, Government are uh, continuing to resist the initiatives of Facebook on uh, its stable coin. Uh, maybe we'll come back to that. But Florence, uh, tell us uh, what's happening at, in Europe and at the ECB. There are lots of projects as well in Europe, uh, but also I think concerns about the issues I raised earlier on um, uh, risks to financial stability, uh, identity issues uh, and others. So over to you, Florence, for a, uh, yes. for a tour of Europe. Thank you, John. Very pleased to be with you today. Um, well, among the many projects uh, and announcements that we have on CBDC, there was, of course, this key one for Europe this summer on July 14, when the ECB uh, announced this Digital Euro project. Uh, it will start with uh, two years um, of investigation on key issues, uh, such as uh, design, uh, distribution, impact, on the market businesses, uh, models, legislative framework. Um, it will have a retail dimension, uh, that's for sure. Um, the ECB will also work with uh, the European Parliament uh, and the European Commission on this, um, notably on the ID uh, issues. Um, if conclusive, um, and this first phase will start as soon as October, um, there will be a, a three year of development. Uh, so a digital euro could uh, become a reality um, in the next four to, to five years. Um, this is why uh, we follow um, those uh, CBDC uh, experiments quite closely. Uh, prior to this uh, ECB announcement, there was some preliminary work from different national central banks, uh, notably on wholesale uh, CBDC. We participated to those of the Banque de France. Banque de France had uh, eight experiments, um, and we participated in uh, the uh, Euroclear and the Liquid Share experiments. Um, and because I think it's important as a as a as a commercial bank, as a as a key player in international uh, banking, to um, to really understand um, and and to ascertain to what extent our clients uh, see interest in CBDC and what impact uh, it may have on the banking system and the business model. And there is, uh, as you rightly pointed, a geographical. Uh, angle to this because um, in Europe, uh, money creation and money distribution is largely uh, driven by commercial bank. Uh, here, uh, banks are systemic to the economy and therefore they are highly uh, regulated. So uh, we think uh, opening an access to central bank money to non-banks drives concerns um, in terms of uh, asymmetry of treatment uh, between payment service providers and banks. Banks are uh, much more regulated, and this is about fair competition. Um, we must have um, equivalent rules and supervision for all actors, 
Uh, it also means uh, for licensing, for authorization and uh, registration procedures. Um, so what is for sure is CBDC uh, design will surely differ from one region to the other. They will not be a, a one size fits all, if you will. Uh, but I think CBDC have something in, in common. Uh, it should be a, um, a viable uh, solution, an optimal solution to, to a clearly uh, defined issue and it should not create more problems than it solves. We're hearing in a number of places, uh, uh, exactly as you say, uh, at central banks, that they are looking at providing um, access uh, to uh, uh, the reserve system um, for a greater number of players, but those players will then have to be reg regulated a little bit like banks. Uh, that, uh, that seems to be the direction that we're, that we're moving in, and we'll explore that um, uh, more as we go. Um, Tony, uh, you're at a, a major... Um, Global Universal Bank. Um, it's a rarer breed than it was, but it's important uh, in the in the world of payments. Um, how important is the potential rollout of CBDCs to commercial banks, in your view? Yeah, John. Thanks for the question. It's great to be on the, the panel. Um, the the importance of of CBDC, I think, remains to be seen. Um, you know, we're yet to see these systems being deployed in anger, if you like, in in many countries. But our view is that if a government uh, wants to exert its sovereign right to launch a new national payment scheme, then we will connect to it. Um, you know, City is connected to 250 clearing systems around the world. In the past, you know, five to seven years, we've connected into 20 instant payment schemes. Maybe in the next five years, we'll be connecting into 20 CBDCs. And our view is that, you know, when you add a new lane to a highway, you don't necessarily get less traffic, you get you get more traffic. And that's been our experience with instant payment schemes that I think will be the experience um, if CBDCs are, are launched. Ha having said that, I think your original question back to Tom was a good one, which is why are we here? And, you know, frankly, the reason I think we are here at this stage in the debate is um, it's certainly not about Bitcoin, uh, because before Libra came along, um, central bankers were writing articles about how Bitcoin will never make it as a form of money. But then things changed with the prospect of a, a stable coin, a, a new instrument, the likes of which we hadn't previously seen. And of course, the official sector had to respond to that challenge to the right of sovereign states to decide what money is. So what I think uh, would be a good thing for the regulated sector to do, for the SWIFT community to do, is to take a step back and think about, at a macro level, how should the regulated community respond to the challenge of unregulated or quasi-regulated forms of money? And my question would be whether narrow CBDC proposals are the best way for the regulated sector to respond. There are two developments in, in parallel, in a sense, uh, Tony. There is. The idea of a stable coin, uh, which might uh, usurp existing payments platforms, and then there is uh, DLT and similar technologies um, that people are talking about to make um, uh, uh, instant payments around the world on a decentralized finance basis. Uh, and it seems to me that banks are starting to um, relax a little bit about the former. It's, it's clear that uh, regulators don't want uh, uh, stable coins to unduly disrupt the system. Uh, but uh, meanwhile, uh, banks are co-opting the latter uh, with a range of uh, uh, DLT experiments. Would you, would you say that's fair, Tony? Yeah, I think those, these developments are also pressing on the minds of commercial banks. And, uh, you know, commercial banks have to think about how they respond in a, in a, in a world of CBDC, stable coins and, and crypto. Um, you know, some banks may come to the conclusion that the appropriate response is to create a bank coin. Um, I also think that that vision leads to fragmentation in the regulated space. And, you know, since you mentioned the, the terminology stable coins, um, I, I wish that, um, you know, credible commentators and policymakers would strip the terminology uh, stable coin from the lexicon because I take to think that consumers hear policymakers or commercial bankers talk about stable coins and for them to get the impression that these instruments are, are stable, when actually until these instruments are brought into the regulatory perimeter, 
they have uh, many questions associated with them. One piece is the backing, and many people are focused on the backing. I'm equally concerned about the potential for stable coins to, for example, because the Act has bearer instruments, um, circumvent sanctions. So I think until such time as stable coins, again, a terminology that I, I very much dislike, comes into the regulatory perimeter, um, I'm, I'm not so sure that the regulated sector should be sanguine about those um, novel forms of money. Uh, Soon Chong, what do you think uh, CBDCs will mean um, for the commercial banking sector? Uh, in a sense, back to our original question, is it an opportunity or a threat um, from, um, from DBS's point of view or for the sector, in your view? So, John, uh, let me try to answer the question in a short way first. I think that whether the CBDCs is an opportunity or a threat uh, very much depends on how they're going to be designed and implemented. Um, at DBS, uh, we have taken the view that um, I think that Pandora's box has been opened uh, with DLT, uh, with new forms of money, as um, Tony said, that are somewhat fettered to fiat, but not completely within the regulated parameters, whether you call them stable coins or not, uh, that's a debate. But there is new forms of money being used uh, as mediums of exchange that are not regulated. Uh, and the third development is uh, with, 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 uh, besides uh, the DLT and the emergence of uh, new networks uh, that are created around commercial banks, uh, blockchain also provides uh, the potential uh, through smart contracts, uh, programmable money for the first time. Right? You can input conditionality into payment for the first time. So just to iterate, there are three major things that happens with uh, blockchain, right? The new peer-to-peer -peer networks, the new forms of money that are semi tethered to fiat, but not completely tethered to fiat, and the possibility of smart contracts, right? Um, so the way we VBS we have thought about this is that we think this is really a potential uh, for us to make the next generational change uh, in payments or to offer payment services, right? Uh, in a regulated fashion that is fully compliant with sanctions, that is the intelligence uh, of smart contracts that is cheaper, better, faster because of the potential of instantaneous settlement. Um, and whether, back to the original question, uh, about whether it is CBDCs or different forms of money, uh, we think it's uh, not as important. I think what is more important to realize is what the blockchain technology and smart contracts offer. Now, if you go back to the very basics of what a blockchain is, a blockchain essentially is a record of financial transactions and the data related to those financial transactions that are posted into many locations simultaneously. Right? That offers the creation of peer-to-peer -peer networks. That network can be used to transfer value or settle financial transactions across a range of instruments. It can be CBDCs, it can be commercial bank money, it can be commercial bank coins that create programmability features. It can be stable coins. It can be any forms of security tokens or illiquid tokens. All can exist on a blockchain network. So the way I would think about it is really depends on how it's implemented. Is CBDCs going to be staying on the same blockchain networks as these newer forms of uh, money or financial instruments, or CBDCs are going to create uh, or central banks are going to create or orchestrate uh, their own financial network. So I think that's the key question in my mind about the network as well as the infrastructure where it's being used for public and private purposes, not so much of whether CBDC uh, itself uh, is going to pose a challenge to the financial sector. Okay, and um, Tony has proposed in a paper that you could gather together regulated forms uh, of money uh, in one uh, regulated uh, network, and perhaps we'll come back um, to that. Just uh, just finishing up on uh, retail uh, CBDC before we look at these whole, wholesale uh, implications. Um, and staying with you uh, soon, Chong, in, uh, in China, um, there is a, uh, a, a two-tier system in, in operation. In uh, real time, how are the banks dealing with that? How does it work through them? Uh, and how do you think it will uh, lead to banks to adapt to a two-tier retail CBDC if that is implemented elsewhere? So for the China case, I, uh, we have applied, DBS has applied to join uh, the ECNY pilot. I must say that the application is still in process. We have not accepted it. So it's uh, 
I can only imagine how that two-tier network is going to be applied. But I think that the way it's going to be constructed is that um, whether you are in tier two, I they call or tier 2.5, uh, all is going to join a central bank orchestrated uh, blockchain network, right? Every bank is going to have a blockchain node, I imagine, in which you will then be able to settle uh, with the rest of the participants on that blockchain node. Um, that is one way in which a two-tier system could operate, right? As we, as uh, Tom has proposed, and then the way that in which we have also implemented and proposed Patior could be used for CBDCs, uh, it's a way whereby different forms of money could stay on the same blockchain network. Hypothetically, what you could have is you could have a blockchain node whereby commercial banks and central bank are on the same node, but it's not managed by the central bank. Uh, and for the forms of money which are moved along the network, which is private money, uh, commercial banks would just orchestrate the movement of money. And uh, if CBDC, uh, the central banks would like to use that particular network to guarantee certain transactions and what we call uh, Synthetic CBDC has been known for, just like the same way as the central bank may guarantee certain deposit accounts, that could also happen. Um, so for China, I think it's still fast evolving. I think what's very clear is China, they will want to orchestrate and manage the blockchain network. Uh, I'm not sure that that, that experience or that uh, intent is generally applicable to the rest of the central banks. And so when you begin to talk about wholesale CBDCs and the interoperability of CBDCs, uh, there will certainly be a lot of issues to overcome and to discuss. Thank you very much, Soon Chong. Uh, Tony, uh, what Soon Chong was just describing sounds a little bit like your proposal from your paper uh, on the uh, uh, on the two tier system that he's just outlined. Would you agree? Indeed. I mean, what we simply propose uh, and what we've entered into the MES CBDC competition is what we call a regulated liability network, and it's a single DLT. And in that DLT, there's a partition for the central banks, and anything in that partition is a central bank liability. There's a partition for each of the commercial banks, and anything, any tokens in those partitions are a liability of the respective commercial banks. Um, but similarly, there's a partition for e-money players because they're part of the regulated sector. Their liabilities are similar in many ways. A promise to pay the bearer on demand or the depositor on demand in national currency units at par value they can live on the same network. And even when so-called stable coins are regulated as um, liabilities of the issuer, those instruments could live on the same network. So what we're really recommending policymakers to consider and for commercial banks to consider, um, let's not have narrow CBDC where everyone has to transact in central bank liabilities. Let's not have bank coins where we fragment the regulated sector and every bank has its own coin. Let's have a shared regulated network where the liabilities of the regulated sector are made fungible on that network. Tom, I wouldn't expect you to be able to have a firm uh, decision either way on uh, what Tony's proposing. Uh, but do you accept this, uh, this idea that you might have uh, regulated forms of money um, cooperating with the central bank in one way or another as distinct from uh, unregulated private forms of money? What do you think, Tom? So, uh, I, I wouldn't want to comment on Tony's proposal. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's excellent, but it would be unfair to try and unpack uh, it here. Is it absolutely true? Uh, and, and uh, you know, Tony has, has emphasized this is interoperability is absolutely critical, and we really must avoid fragmentation. That, that's, uh, that's what causes inefficiency and, and poor outcomes in the system. Uh, so, uh, interoperability, whether it's retail CBDC, wholesale CBDC, uh, whether it's uh, Payments platforms, interoperability is absolutely uh, critical and it's, uh, it, it's what delivers good outcomes. Um, of course, uh, what I would say is that um, we have uh, you know, a very uh, steady framework which has worked well for, for many years around uh, private money and the role of the central bank in providing wholesale services, uh, providing infrastructure, providing wholesale settlements. Um, and indeed, that is very much the foundation of our two-tier monetary system. So I think that does work. Um, and on uh, new forms of money, um, well, we've been really clear through the Financial Policy Committee that if new forms of digital money uh, are to arrive, uh, they must display the same confidence, security, resilience uh, as existing forms of money. Um, so that's uh, absolutely non-negotiable for us. Um, and uh, if uh, people are to develop new forms of money, as well as meeting those principles, they would, of course, have to be appropriately regulated. 
Uh, I think one um, point I would make on wholesale central bank digital currency is, um, as I said, wholesale central bank digital currency is not a new idea. We've had reserves for a long time. Uh, I think much of the innovation we're seeing, which is desirable, is actually in how to interface with uh, those sorts of uh, those sorts of uh, reserves. And actually, I think things like the real time gross settlement service, which we're currently renewing in in the UK, uh, is exactly the designed to sort of uh, support these new and innovative uh, business models uh, where they're appropriately regulated uh, and where they're safe. Uh, and I think that actually um, a really important thing is not perhaps to present uh, new forms of tokenized assets or wholesale central bank digital currency or uh, regulated private uh, wholesale liabilities, uh, perhaps not to present them as being um, at odds with the current system, but actually to think about how things like the renewed uh, real-time growth assessment service are complementary to, to, to those sorts of innovations, uh, because that's very much the way that we would like to proceed in the UK, which is uh, to see that central bank infrastructure supporting innovation, um, uh, rather than perhaps seeing them as uh, somehow being uh, at odds with each other. Thanks. We're going to explore tokenization in just a moment. Uh, just staying with you, Tom, um, how would a wholesale CBC differ from RTGS, for example? It's, it's not clear that it's uh, materially different. Uh, it, it may be, but I can't see how at the moment. Thinking about uh, how these are complementary is actually quite a, a good place to start. So um, if a wholesale uh, central bank digital currency is to uh, generate better clearing, settlement, better wholesale payments, uh, then that's a good thing. Uh, as I said, uh, wholesale central bank digital currency is not new. We've had reserves for quite a long time. Uh, and the real-time growth settlement service is a way in which we interact with those reserves and it's a platform to do that. Um, and the renewal of that RCGS service is going to support innovation. Um, it's intended to support a wide range of new uh, business models. Uh, and indeed, we've undertaken experiments uh, with distributed ledger. Uh, we're using the ISO 222 standard, which I think should uh, you know, really help with questions like interoperability. Um, and uh, we very much see you know, great, great potential for that renewed uh, RCGS service. Okay. Um, and Ultimately, what will happen there is that um, that service is the way in which to interact with reserves. If people want to develop new um, new uh, ways of thinking about tokenized assets or uh, new forms of uh, liability which uh, seek to be backed with reserves, um, then uh, obviously there's a discussion about how that's regulated. But the RTGS service would still be the platform through which those interactions happen. Uh, and indeed, we've uh, published recently an omnibus accounts policy to try and support some of these new business models uh, where they meet the necessary regulatory standards. Got it. Uh, Florence, uh, it, it seems to me that, uh, that DLT technology in payments and CBDC is sometimes used interchangeably, but don't need to be, uh, as, uh, as we've just learned from listening to Tom. Um, what uh, what do you think on whether wholesale CBDC is uh, is necessary versus uh, incorporating DLT technology into wholesale payments between um, central banks and their um, counterparties in the private sector and elsewhere? Maybe a, a way to answer that question is to uh, assess what is currently uh, possible to do and is is a wholesale CBDC necessary? Uh, to settle tokenized uh, assets, for instance, yeah. because today in the Eurozone, uh, we settle securities in central bank money already uh, via target to in T2S. And um, in T2S is very efficient. It's fast. It allows full uh, netting, uh, which means economy of collateral and, uh, and liquidity. Um, to fully benefit from, from the blockchain uh, technology, uh, it's important that the cash leg of tokenized assets uh, is also settles on the blockchain. But the problem today is um, it is not currently possible. The only way to do that is via private digital currencies, such as uh, stable coins, because uh, currently there is no bridge uh, in the blockchain uh, between, between, um, uh, between T2S and the blockchain, if you will. So um, obviously, um, doing this via stable coins is not optimal because it does not equal central bank money in terms of uh, credit risk. Um, you could also settle uh, the digital assets uh, cash leg off chain. Uh, but in that case, um, you would not fully benefit uh, from the, the, black chain, uh, the blockchain ecosystem. Um, that's why tokenized asset development is linked uh, to wholesale CBDC. But there is a key issue uh, because, with that, because 
liquidity fragmentation is, is at stake here, and notably in the Eurozone. Uh, as I just explained, uh, today everything is done with this unique platform, T2S, um, but that would be quite different uh, in the blockchain world because uh, there are multiple blockchains, and this would require multiple uh, pockets of liquidity to, to accommodate this, um, because netting between blockchain is not yet possible, and that leads to uh, liquidity fragmentation. Uh, and that means higher costs uh, for banks. You need more cash, you need more collateral uh, to, to accommodate the exact same business currently done via T2S. Uh, and to tackle this, uh, to come back to, to, to Tom's point, you need interoperability between platforms. You need smart tools allowing uh, intraday uh, funding, etc. And do you expect that interoperability comes up in uh, pretty much every discussion on CBDCs, whether it's between platforms or between, between jurisdictions? Uh, and it seems quite hard to solve, and indeed uh, commercial banks have already solved it uh, in many ways. Uh, do you think uh, regulators and private sector participants will solve this interoperability issue? It seems pretty hard to crack. It is indeed, it's complex, uh, but that, that is a prerequisite uh, to be, if we really want this to be fully operational and to be, um, to, to, to be an efficient solution compared to what is already existing, which is, by the way, uh, uh, working well and reliable and under uh, development. So that's why it is um, key to have co collaboration, dialogue uh, with, with our peers, with public stakeholders, with clients also to identify the pain points, to explore uh, solutions uh, and converge uh, towards consensus. Final point uh, on that. We, we often hear um, DLT companies in the DMI uh, at OMFIF uh, trying to work around the fact that the technology is at odds with the idea of uh, central oversight uh, uh, and regulation. Um, do you see that being fixed on a technological basis? I don't, I don't think really that the, 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 the technology is, is important, but beyond that, I think it's important to have a a, a, a common, uh, to go back to my point on regulation, that's, I think it's absolutely important if you don't want to create more problems that you, that you solve, if you um, don't want to have uh, um, unwanted consequences to, to really assess uh, that cautiously and to, and to move uh, really step by step. Tony, how does the trend towards uh, tokenization of assets impact uh, commercial banks' uh, business models uh, more broadly. So one thinks of um, quite interesting applications in uh, capital markets. Uh, the EIB is issued a DLT bond, for example. Um, what do you see as the scope for, uh, for tokenization? Again, you've, you've written about this, and it could be quite exciting um, uh, beyond CBDC. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's what I would call the tokenization thesis, and the, the DLT community would, or some in the, in the community would argue that in the future, all forms of, of assets, um, you know, whether money or securities or equities or what have you, um, are better expressed on in DLT style tokenization compared to the traditional way in which we do it in the financial system today. And and I can I can kind of discern three aspects of that thesis. I'm not saying that I support that thesis, but if I compare, um, for example, the Ethereum blockchain to our financial system. Ethereum is always on, the financial system is not, hardly anything in the financial system is always on, faster payment schemes being the exception to prove the rule. Secondly is that Ethereum is inherently multi-asset. You know, on Ethereum you have ETH, stable coins, crypto kitties, NFTs, so Ethereum is a lot less siloed than the traditional financial system. You know, everyone's familiar with banking silos. What is a banking silo? It's a dedicated infrastructure to process a particular type of, of legal instrument. And we've got silos within banks and we've got silos across the financial landscape. And then the third thing is back to Sun Chong's point, which is if you've got this kind of like general bean counting layer, um, a, a more generic way of recording assets and liabilities, then to have a, a, a smart contracting layer on top of that, a programmable layer on top of that, may lead to very interesting innovation. So that's the thesis. The thesis is that at a global level, um, you know, blockchain DLT style tokenization exhibits qualities that are not currently found in today's financial system, which is not always on, extremely siloed and not programmable. So that's the idea. 
And do you think, uh, Tony, those could be adopted uh, regardless of CBDC? It seems to me that those couldn't exist uh, in parallel. They're not uh, contingent on one another. Yeah, potentially. I mean, we can make the banking systems always on. Um, you know, we can potentially make them a little bit more multi-asset, although I think the way in which we record financial instruments at the moment is fairly embedded into those uh, monolithic systems that we're running. And in terms of programmability, well, maybe if the banking system was bristling with standardized APIs, it would be programmable, but it's not. And therefore, I do think we have to examine the tokenization thesis carefully and think about whether DLT style representation of assets and liabilities might lead to a qualitatively different and less siloed um, always on financial system. It's definitely worth exploring, and that's what we're exploring in the context of the MES CBDC challenge. Uh, Soon Chong, in fact, back to, to you and Singapore. Um, what do you see as the potential for wholesale CBDC or indeed the technology that people are talking about for CBDC? Uh, on the business models of, uh, of commercial banks, whether in transaction services or the, the commercial uh, corporate investment banking components of the banks? Sure, John. Um, I think that the, just to iterate and to link to the discussions that we had with Florence and, um, and Tony, right? I think that the wholesale uh, DLT or DLT being applied uh, for wholesale payments carries immense potential uh, for both tokenized assets or uh, in settlement of securities and assets, uh, as well as for cross-border payments, right? For the, I, I think that it takes both, not just the private sector or it takes the public sector, but it takes both the public sector and the private sector to work together on DLT technology. On tokenization to Florence's point, I think that you do need the cash leak for a security settlement transaction to be better, faster, cheaper, but it's not obvious that uh, in a cross-border context that CBDC is necessarily up to the role. Uh, because when you have two central banks trying to argue uh, or try to settle uh, upon which uh, sovereign jurisdiction or which set of laws prevail in a case of a settlement problem uh, or a breach of a sanctions contract, that would not necessarily be a desirable outcome. So I think it involves, uh, it, it is actually better to have commercial bank or to have private sector uh, created money um, to solve the DBP uh, solutions. Uh, and to Tony's point, I think that for the cross-border payments, well, I think for cross-border payments, it's very all efficient in Europe with Target because everybody uses the Euro. Uh, in Asia, actually, you have tremendous problems to solve with cross-border payments outside the US, uh, whether it's intra-Asia or with Asia and other non-US jurisdictions, for example, between Asia and the Middle East. As we all know, today, cross-border payments happens in US dollars, and it goes to a central ledger in the Federal Reserve to clear that particular payments, right? Within Asia, it could be sitting next door to Malaysia as a neighbor, and for dollar payment, it goes all the way back to the US uh, to a centralized clearing house uh, before it comes back and, uh, and gets paid. Um, so I think that when you uh, talk about what Tony talked about, right, that when you combine the always-on feature of DLT, uh, you combine the potential of interoperability, whether it's multi-asset class or geographic interoperability, you layer on a third layer of smart contracts and programmability. Uh, all of that potential for use of DLT for solving, whether it's on uh, tokenized asset settlement and cross-border payments carries immense potential. And that's why we have invested in Patio uh, with Tomasic and JP Morgan to solve some of those problems. But that's it. There are always issues. The issue is with the money and the quality of money that Tony talks about. That often uh, for, for networks to do, the problem is with credit risk and with trust. And if central banks can come together, provide their balance sheet and their facilities of lender of last resort to inject trust and credibility into the system without ne ne necessarily uh, orchestrating the system or running the system, I think that public-private partnership and collaboration will be much more better to create a much more efficient financial system. Uh, very much as uh, Tom was espousing at the beginning. Tom, very briefly, do you think the, uh, the public sector, you know, central banks working together, will solve the interoperability issues cross-border, uh, or do you think that the private sector perhaps might get that first, get there first, not least because it's already doing it? What do you think, Tom? So, uh, 
Florence is right. It, it's really difficult, uh, but we have no option but to solve the interoperability issue. Like it has to be in there from the start at the core. Uh, fragmentation delivers really bad outcomes and it delivers weak and fragile systems as well. Um, I don't think the central banks can do it on their own, but actually nor do I think the private sector can do it on their own. It has to be a partnership. And when I think about interoperability, I think there's a whole set of requirements that we need actually. Um, and some of them are best provided by the public sector, some of them are best provided by the private sector, but they all have to fit together into a, a, a coherent whole. So for me, the things that deliver interoperability uh, in principle are the right technology, uh, critically the right standards, which is data standards, messaging standards, but also operational processes. Uh, Tony talked about the um, about the always on nature and the fact that you know many aspects of the financial system aren't. As much as anything, that's an operational issue uh, as much as a, as a technology issue. Um, we, of course, need policy and regulation, which works across borders. Uh, that is uh, not something we always uh, necessarily delivered, but it's something uh, working through places like the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructure. We really want to deliver that, and they've got a roadmap for cross-border payments. Of course, critically, to have interoperability, we need to have stability uh, and safety of value. Um, you can't have interoperability between items which don't have the same resilience, security, and stability of value. Um, and then uh, also really importantly, just mentioned, uh, you also need to have legal certainty, effective mechanisms for reconciling disputes. So interoperability comes from a whole range of areas. Some of that's best provided by the state, some of it's best provided by the central banks, some of it's best provided by the private sector. And I really hope that the G20 CPMI uh, FSB roadmap and cross-border payments uh, will, will really help uh, provide the leadership we need on that. Excellent, sounds like a, a public-private uh, partnership required all round to tackle these very difficult uh, issues. Thank you all. Um, we've got some qu audience questions coming in, uh, which Tony and Soon Chong uh, are joining me to discuss. Meanwhile, thanks very much, uh, Tom and Florence, for being with us today. Thank you very much uh, to my panellists. Uh, quickly, before we turn to uh, audience questions. We've had a couple of important ones uh, in uh, in the last uh, few minutes. I wanted to pose to you, the audience, uh, the question that we started exploring right at the beginning. Uh, so do please vote on this on the Slido link. And the question is whether CBDCs from a banker's point of view, commercial banker's point of view, is an opportunity or a challenge. So please do vote on that now uh, and we'll have a look at whether the answer is different from the one that we first uh, mentioned right at the beginning where we, it was seen uh, and on a majority basis uh, as an opportunity. Um, now to a couple of uh, audience uh, questions. Uh, it's a, a, an important one on the topic we were just discussing, um, which is uh, how wholesale CBDC will actually look. And Tony, I wanted to turn to you on that. Um, how, uh, how could it be implemented? Uh, and indeed, should it run in parallel to the uh, rails that already exist between uh, uh, commercial banks as it stands. Over to you, Tony. Hi. Uh, as Tom, you know, alluded to in the discussion, um, we've had digital central bank money for, for many years. And the concept of wholesale CBDC is essentially a kind of you know, rebasing or replatforming an RTGS system onto DLT technology uh, based upon the idea that if we're going to have tokenized assets, it would be very handy to have um, tokenized money so that you could perform uh, DVP and PVP type settlements in a fully tokenized uh, manner. So if, if we just um, think about wholesale CBDC, as a one-to-one -one replacement for RTGS systems, then perhaps we're not going to achieve a great leap forward. What we think is an intriguing possibility is in the concept of the regulated liability network and having multiple central banks express their liabilities into the same DLT. And, and then what you have is you know, real GBP central bank money, real Singapore central bank money on, available on the same DLT, then essentially what you achieve is a global 24 by 7 RTGS system. And that would be 
a leap ahead in terms of the functionality available to the financial system. Uh, Soon Chong, um, how do you see uh, wholesale CBDC developing uh, in practice uh, and, and do we need it in parallel to what already exists? So I agree with Tony and uh, Tom that I think that the potential uh, for CBDCs to solve some of the problems we have in the financial markets are immense. Um, but I would say I'll bring it down to there are four priorities. Um, the four priorities, as we said, is the always on nature that we discussed during the discussion. We want it to be 24 by 7. And we're trying to solve three sets of interoperability issues. The first is cross-border interoperability, uh, PVP and foreign exchange. The second is really about multi-asset interoperability, um, DVP, uh, that Tony talks about, uh, settlement for securities and tokens. And the third is domestic interoperability, the interoperability for domestic payments with payment service organizations, with banks and with commercial banks. So the nature in which I think CBDCs will evolve uh, would depend on the public and the private sector coming together and say, besides solving the instantaneous settlement problem, which sets of problems can be solved effectively first, right? Um, and so for what we've done with Papua, we've tried to solve the cross-border interoperability and the cross-asset settlement problem first, right? And uh, I can't speak for what Tony has the idea, but the regulated liabilities concept perhaps emphasizes the domestic interoperability question more uh, than the cross-border one. So I think there will be these kind of issues that central banks, um, when they look at launching the CBDCs and replacing um, the RTJ system with the next generation technology, what problems they want to solve. Right now, I think central banks are both with the experiments that you're seeing, uh, focusing on two ends, both the domestic interoperability and the cross-border interoperability, as we can see from all the pilots and all the um, sort of experiments and the infrastructure initiatives that we see across central banks. A quick supplementary <laughs> question on that, uh, Soon Chong. What would be the forum for bank for central banks to um, organise this system through, presumably the BAS uh, or, a, or a similar type of organisation? Yeah, so earlier in the discussion, I mentioned that there is a project Dunba, then in which the BIS Innovation Hub is uh, responsible for uh, doing that. Clearly, I think that there is going to be some issues around this because the even on the uh, on that technology infrastructure orchestration, um, I must say central banks and Tom said that central banks not necessarily has got an advantage, a comparative advantage in terms of technology infrastructure. So I do see that one route will be through the BIS and through official agencies, but through we, we see that through Patio and through many uh, of this, that the private sector coming and offering infrastructure and technology solutions to central banks so that the interoperability promise could be realised. Uh, Tony, we talked uh, a lot earlier about DLT. Uh, you and I were talking uh, the other day uh, with the uh, PBOC about its pilot project, which chose not to use uh, DLT. Um, why was that? It was, um, well, according to Mr. Mu, it's because of the, the current state of DLT in terms of its uh, you know, technical limitations. Um, but that may well change over time. Uh, the DLTs that we have today are not as performant as the DLTs that we will have in, in five years or, or 10 years. I think what it's useful to do is to you know, think about what, if anything, is, is special about DLT or, or particularly interesting about DLT. And, and one aspect that I'm intrigued by, which goes back to the, the, the Bitcoin white paper, which defines an electronic coin as a chain of digital signatures. What I'm interested in, in particular, is the, is the multi-asset nature of DLT. Um, you know, I've lived with banking silos for 30 years. We all have on this in this community. We've lived with banking silos, which means special purpose infrastructure around specific legal assets. Um, the, the history of technology is moving from the specific to the generic. You know, desk calculators are replaced by universal Turing machines, which can process anything. And so maybe we're on the same path when it comes to financial infrastructure. Maybe we can have a more um, generic way of recording financial instruments. 
on a common substrate and then that substrate being 24 by 7 and programmable that at least is an intriguing thesis to explore soon chong any comments on uh, dlt and why the pboc chose not to use it so far i've heard that they simply thought it would not scale to an economy of uh, 1.4 billion people uh, but no doubt the technology will improve over you to soon chong well so i can't I don't have that um, that the insight as to how the balance of the trade-off. I mean, but generic, gener generically, I mean, the, the consensus uh, validation mechanism and the immutability trade-offs have to be thought through, right? So uh, just for the uh, purpose of the audience, I mean, the various forms that are used out there, whether is it a proof of work, a proof of stake, a proof of authority, they have different trade-offs between um, immutability, security on, on one hand, and on the other hand, um, the uh, efficiency, right, uh, uh, and, and the energy intensity or the, the size of the network taken to validate a transaction. So I think that the PBOC must have certain reasons uh, for, for given its considerations on the scale of the project and the security it wants to achieve that it feels that the current thing is not good enough. Uh, but I would say having used it uh, internally within the bank and having launched Patio and doing this, I do think that... Um, the, the DLT technology and, and using that uh, for most of the payments transactions in terms of security uh, and in terms of the efficiency achieves a pretty good uh, level um, uh, of technology relevance uh, to the payments, uh, to, the, to the use cases and the problems we're trying to solve. Thank you, Soon Chong. Um, China, 1.4 billion, completely different scale, right? Exactly. Uh, we're, um, we're out of time, so I thought I'd just reveal the results of the poll that we ran. Um, slightly uh, less uh, optimism uh, than the poll we ran first, but still overwhelmingly regarded as an opportunity, despite uh, certainly the challenges originally hoping to displace banks altogether from the financial system. We've heard why that is uh, really not uh, likely or possible. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Uh, it's a complex but fascinating area uh, and moving very fast. So uh, we will speak to you again about it very soon. Thank you all.